Systems. Martial artists are obsessed with them. Grappling systems, self-defense systems, the common usage of the phrase entering the system. It seems like every time I turn over a rock, there's a martial artist under it with a system to sell me. Systems have not only become an essential component of high-level competition, but also a marketing gimmick to make a given martial art sound more organized. However, calling something a system doesn't make it one. And martial arts aren't necessarily good just because they contain systems. So let's go over what a system is, the pros and cons of using them, and how to use them in a helpful way. Also, if you want to play a fun drinking game, take a shot every time I say the word system. I call this game alcohol poisoning. Now, to understand what a system is, let's first step back and understand martial arts. A martial art is a very broad category and can contain thousands, if not millions, of individual techniques. It can include a multitude of moves, styles, and strategies, and two practitioners in the same art could have entirely different methods of fighting. Systems, however, are different. For our purposes, a system is a group of interrelated and interdependent moves that are able to form links in a chain leading to a desired end state. The purpose of a system is to give someone a reliable and predictable path to follow towards victory. An example of a system is the 10th Planet Lockdown series. Each move presents a clear way to progress further into the system, with each move allowing the user to respond to a different action by their opponent. And each move is interdependent with the moves around it. The whip up is impossible to do without using Jaws of Life or the whip down to gain the underhook. And the whip up is absolutely pointless unless it's followed by one of these attacks. These are not random moves that happen to be able to link together. This is a purposefully designed system that wouldn't be useful in any other arrangement. The overall system becomes more than the sum of its parts, allowing practitioners to use a flowchart as a reliable path to follow towards victory. Side note, this is only a tiny piece of the lockdown series because I made this flowchart myself in like five minutes. Don't at me. Now, there's a bunch of nonsense out there that claims to be an effective fighting system while neither being effective nor even a system. So how can we tell what's a system and what's just a marketing gimmick? Thankfully, all martial arts systems are going to share a few commonalities that can help us identify them. Namely, can the system be made into a navigable flowchart and does it effectively present dilemmas? But wait, what's the difference between a problem and a dilemma? You might think they mean the same thing, but they don't. Problems have solutions, potentially endless solutions. For example, stopping a runaway train is a problem. You could communicate with the conductor or railway authorities to shut it down, reroute it to a safer path, wait for it to run out of fuel, lasso it with giant rubber bands, purposefully crash it somewhere isolated, sabotage the track so it derails, hit it with another train, order a missile strike, call a superhero, etc. You get the point. A problem is something that can be solved, potentially with very good solutions. But I don't want my opponent to have a good solution. So instead of presenting my opponent with a problem, I present them with a dilemma. A dilemma is a situation that presents you with a small number of equally bad choices. Something like the trolley problem, despite having problem in the title, is ironically a dilemma because you can either pull the lever or not pull the lever. Those are the only two options and they're both terrible. If you've ever played the game Would You Rather, then you've experienced a dilemma. Dilemmas are important in creating a system because you have to be able to limit your opponent's actions to as few moves as possible. By using dilemmas to give your opponent fewer choices, you're more easily able to predict their moves and keep them within the confines of your system. For example, if you have your opponent in staple mount, which other people call leg drag even though leg drag is already a different move, they have to escape because they're being punched in the face. To do this, they can either retreat to their back, giving you greater submission and passing opportunities, or they can try to retreat to turtle, giving you the Dagestani handcuff and making them even more stuck. Now, this example is a little oversimplified, but it's still a good illustration of a dilemma where both strategies presented to them are bad and you're prepared for all possible outcomes. Populating my system with dilemmas allows me to create a simple and easy to follow flowchart. Compare this to another position like full mount. My opponent could shrimp, oompa, turtle, go out the back door, suck a leg back into half guard, or a hundred other things. 
all of the listed escapes are different moves that lead to different positions, making the relevant flowchart much more complicated and harder to learn. Plus, many of the options I listed from mount are good solutions that dramatically improve my opponent's position. Staple mount presents a dilemma, while a standard full mount presents a problem. And no, this doesn't mean that full mount can't exist in a system, it just means that your offense and positioning has to be more specific. In a systemized approach, dilemmas work well and problems work poorly. Remember that a martial arts system is something that you have to remember and execute while under stress. If your system looks like this, it's not going to work. Limiting your opponent's options makes your system's flowchart smaller and easier to understand. In addition, dilemmas allow your moveset to be whittled down to only the best and highest percentage options. This makes your system more effective and easier to master. Having a navigable flowchart allows you to track where you are and move back and forth within a given system, with the objective being to continuously progress towards a defined goal. And having a good goal is important. It's part of what defines a system in martial arts. Most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu systems ultimately lead to a submission. The control wrestling system that Khabib used leads to his opponent's exhaustion, followed by a submission. And not only does a system need to have a goal, but the flowchart needs to obviously and inevitably lead them there. Note that the lockdown flowchart I showed earlier does have a few opportunistic submission opportunities, but the overall system is pretty obviously aimed at establishing top side control. If your system does not create dilemmas, cannot be made into a navigable flowchart, and does not have a specific victory condition, then it's not a system. It's just a collection of moves. Martial arts are often expansive repositories of various techniques and strategies, often built atop a few core assumptions and guidelines. A system, on the other hand, is an interconnected flowchart of dilemmas aimed at addressing a highly specific situation in pursuit of a specific goal. A system is not merely a streamlined martial art. It's a tiny sliver of a martial art boiled down into a useful game plan. A martial art can teach you how to handle yourself in a wide variety of violent encounters. A system teaches you how to handle yourself very well in a specific position. As an example, 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu is a martial art, while the Rubber Guard series is a system. The Rubber Guard series exists within the framework of 10th Planet and it exclusively covers how to get a submission or sweep from bottom guard. Bottom half guard, top side control, and top mount all involve different systems within the same martial art. However, outside of submission grappling arts, the word system is rarely used correctly by martial artists. The term system has become a buzzword within martial arts, becoming just as useless as synergy or influencer, used to mean basically everything until it effectively means nothing at all. Nowhere is the overuse of the word system more endemic than in the reality-based self-defense industry. Defense Lab has been marketed as a system, Krav Maga has been marketed as a system, and Sistema just straight up named itself the system. From my viewpoint, none of these should be called systems. If they're systems, then every other martial art is also a system, and then the term is meaningless. And if your entire martial art is one system, you either have a very bad system, or you have a very bad martial art. And probably both. To underscore the difference, here's a flowchart from John Donaher's back attack system. Now, this graphic actually contains multiple systems and auxiliary systems, so let's zoom into the primary system and just look at that. Here we see a detailed list of specific moves used to solve specific problems. Each position has two or three branches based on how your opponent reacts to the presented dilemma. The system doesn't lead to winning, but specifically to a rear naked choke. Now compare this flowchart to one used to describe Krav Maga, and tell me if you can pick out any key differences. The Krav Maga flowchart is obviously hyperbole, but even if we go to completely serious flowcharts, we notice a profound lack of detail, an opponent with no agency, and a complete absence of forced dilemmas. And that's because these flowcharts are made for something that isn't actually systematized. The only way it can fit into a flowchart is by squinting until the whole art kind of blurs together into vague suggestions like multiple attacks to weak points and hit. Wow, thanks system, I never would have thought of that. So whenever an entire martial art claims to be a cohesive system, immediately know that they're full of baloney. 
but just to be cheeky, go ahead and ask to see their flowchart. On the off chance they're able to give you one, ask yourself whether it contains specific moves, whether the opponent is facing real dilemmas, and whether there's a strategy to win baked into the system itself. Bad or fake systems often present an overly simplified view of your opponent and your martial art. They fail to prescribe specific moves and insist on asking you questions instead of giving you answers. Notice that at no point in either of these flowcharts does your opponent take any actions or present you with any problems. Likewise, they also fail to present your opponent with any dilemmas, or work to progress you towards a victory any more specific than run. Just because systems can be made into flowcharts doesn't mean that any flowchart is automatically a system. Okay, now that we know what is and is not a system, let's look at how and why systems are actually effective. Why should we learn a system instead of just learning a martial art broadly? Well, systems can present a number of advantages, such as being easier to learn and providing students with a proven roadmap to success. You see, every practitioner eventually designs their own game, which consists of the moves that they often find success with built around a strategy that they like to implement. Essentially, every practitioner of a martial art eventually builds their own personalized system. But building these systems can be slow and difficult, often taking years of study to design a game that's even remotely fleshed out. And once you do build your own game, you often find that you move to a higher level and your system gets shut down, because there are fundamental flaws in your approach that lower level practitioners couldn't exploit, but higher level practitioners absolutely can. Instead of making each practitioner struggle to create a personal game plan after years of work, a systemized approach to martial arts involves simply teaching new students a pre-built system that has already been proven effective at a high level. This gives students a much better starting position, allowing them to learn a smaller number of higher percentage moves in a structured approach that will continue to work even when they get to the highest levels of usage and competition. If you're a giant nerd, think of systems like a trading card starter deck that can actually win tournaments. You could painstakingly assemble your own deck by buying several dozen booster packs and tediously experimenting with various card combinations and strategies, or you could just buy a deck that already works at a high level. Without a systemized approach, you're stuck learning random moves in a random order until you're lucky enough to be able to piece them together into something that kind of works. Learning a martial art can take a very long time, but learning a system is comparatively easy, and this can allow students to make much greater strides, especially in the early phases of their training. And learning to modify a system to fit your specific needs is often much easier than creating a system from scratch. In addition, having a group of people all practicing the same system can create its own advantages. Having dozens of people experimenting with a system is much more likely to create new innovations and patch holes. As an example, 10th Planet's Rubber Guard system originally contained the move The London, but the move was eventually abandoned when subsequent experimentation revealed that a counter move could reliably exploit an opening that The London created. And if he starts the cartwheel, it's too late to pull my left arm out. It's trapped under my own leg. No more London. That's done. If it wasn't for the experimentation of 10th Planet's early students, this weakness might have never been fixed. Overall, systems allow new students to more fully benefit from the work of others by not only being able to use fully tested moves, but also fully tested chains of moves and competitively proven strategies. We can most easily see the advantage of systems in the context of competitive Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. One of the first people to begin a formal systemization of submission grappling was Eddie Bravo, who actually founded 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu. As a result of this organization-wide systemization, the relatively small group of 10th Planet practitioners began to see disproportionate success in submission-only tournaments, which is the rule set that they actually trained for. However, they were soon supplanted by the Donaher Death Squad. Donaher, a formerly trained expert in learning heuristics and methodologies, secured his place in grappling history through the development of systems so effective that it left the entire grappling world, including 10th Planet, playing catch-up. And this rivalry of competing systems dominating basically every no-gi submission-only tournament made the rest of the grappling world take notice. 
As more and more gyms began implementing systems, 10th Planet began a slow fall from prominence, with their early advantage in systemization now being leveled out. However, John Donaher and his students have managed to remain at the top of the sport, largely through Donaher's continued development of grappling systems. In essence, certain aspects of submission grappling now almost entirely revolve around the implementation of ever more effective systems. This has resulted in the grappling meta looking very different than it did even just a decade ago. Even in MMA, the mythical status of Dagestani fighters such as Khabib and Islam Makachev is often erroneously chalked up to the idea that the mountains of Dagestan somehow breed warriors. In reality, nearly all of these fighters trained under the late Adolmanop Nurmagomedov, who will likely go down in history as a pioneer of MMA systemization. Or at least he should. Nearly all of these students used the same control wrestling system, and Adolmanap's greatest success was his son Khabib, who managed to master this system earlier and to a higher degree than any of his teammates. And with no one else in MMA prepared to address strong systems, Khabib's early adoption allowed him to steamroll nearly everyone he came across, while using the same takedowns, positions, and submissions on virtually all of his opponents. Adolmanap's origin in a relatively poor and remote location means that he lacked access to the same resources that most other coaches take for granted. Despite this, his system allowed nearly all of his students to have disproportionate success in the highest levels of martial arts. And this should tell you how important systemization is becoming. So if systems are so great, why do we even teach martial arts? Why not just boil down each art to its most dominant systems and throw out everything else? Well, as great as systems are, there are also a few drawbacks. And these drawbacks become much more pronounced when the system doesn't exist in a larger and less organized martial art. First of all, a good system is going to be broadly applicable but not every system is going to work for every person. Some people are going to have certain body types or personality traits that make it more difficult for them to execute a specific system. Anyone with poor flexibility that's tried a rubber guard will likely attest to that fact. Having more systems allows more people to find one that works best for them, and having a large multifaceted martial art allows other people to draw from that well and make their own systems too. And while being strictly trained in a specific system might allow you to make faster progress, it can also hinder exploration and innovation. If you're only ever taught a small subset of moves and a predetermined strategy, your ability to think outside the box and employ new moves and strategies is going to be limited. Being corralled into a specific way of fighting for your entire martial arts career can have the unintended side effect of constraining your ability to employ novel problem-solving techniques or view dilemmas from a different point of view. The shortcomings of a systematic approach can be partially mitigated by making sure that systems exist within a larger martial art. This means that students are able to explore other systems within the same art and they're able to draw on a much wider and less organized well of knowledge to create and modify systems as they see fit. Having systematic approaches exist within a martial art allows students to make fast progress while still allowing for a level of modification and personal exploration that encourages practitioners to continue to innovate and search for ever more effective systems. This means that we can't ever strip down a martial art to only its most effective systems, because that art will essentially become frozen in time, unable to evolve further. Just because some moves or strategy don't fit into the current dominant systems doesn't mean that they won't become building blocks for future innovations. In addition, remember that systems are only a small snapshot of a greater martial art. Even several systems will never give you the full picture, and you have to rely on your own knowledge and fundamental skills to fill in the gaps. John Donaher has talked about how his systems are almost always offensive in nature, and that his students' defense comes from their understanding of the fundamentals. However, these fundamentals are not specific moves, but are instead various solutions to problems. Being able to escape side control is a fundamental skill, but it doesn't matter if you do it by recovering guard, wrestling up, sweeping, or turtling, so long as you can do it. By allowing his students to master fundamental skills in unique and individual ways, Donaher actually solves two problems. 
First of all, his students, which all follow the same systems, are now less predictable, which prevents the implementation of reliable counter systems. Second of all, this allows each student to experiment with those systems while drawing from a different background of fundamentals. By using different approaches to problems, Donaher's students are often able to innovate on existing systems more quickly, making those systems better for the entire gym. Donaher uses a less structured approach to fundamentals to counteract many of the potential disadvantages of systemization. On the other side of the spectrum is 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu. While 10th Planet's decline was brought on by losing its early adopter advantage, I would argue that it was hastened by the over systemization of its curriculum. With one system linking flawlessly into another, 10th Planet practitioners spent virtually all of their training time using or responding to one of their own systems, with very little room for chaotic scrambles or innovation. Even their warm-ups became complex changes of moves built on their existing systems. This meant that while the Donaher Death Squad was busy innovating, 10th Planet was stuck trying to copy their homework, ensuring that they were always at least a step behind. Even the bottom-up innovations within 10th Planet, such as the Puppet Master, Tangled Up Control, and Dead Orchard, weren't new strategies or new systems. They were merely extensions on systems that 10th Planet already had. The underlying assumptions, goals, and progression of their existing systems were never truly questioned or significantly modified, because no one at their gyms did much outside of those systems. Now, these kinds of problems are most often a result of toxic gym cultures and authoritarian leadership styles. However, in this case, I think that over-systemization truly is much more to blame. Tenth Planet is actually rather famous for questioning the norms and traditions of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and having an exceptionally laissez faire approach to styles and innovation. Students were perfectly free to question assumptions and implement new ideas, with many of those ideas even being fed up the chain to Eddie Bravo in order to be dispersed throughout the rest of the art. Cross training was encouraged and differing goals and perspectives were often listened to. 10th Planet has always possessed an exceptionally tolerant attitude towards change and innovation, even implementing leg locks into their curriculum shortly after their appearance on the competitive scene. Despite this, innovation came too little, too late, because many of its students simply didn't have the foundational knowledge or training experiences necessary to properly experiment. While other gyms were busy building brand new systems around the most up-to-date moves and strategies, 10th Planet was trying to Frankenstein useful moves into their existing movesets, resulting in overcomplicated and bloated systems that were no longer optimized for a specific goal. While 10th Planet never got worse, its competition managed to get a lot better, and 10th Planet never quite managed to keep up. Most of its notable practitioners are now far removed from their prime, and there don't seem to be many up-and-comers to replace them with 10th Planet's only hopes of competitive relevance now falling entirely to Grace Gundrum. Its rise and ultimately its slow fall are partially due to the same thing, systemization. Systems are one of the most powerful tools in martial arts, but they do have distinct drawbacks that have to be carefully managed. Without a counterbalancing force, a gym can have too much of a good thing. Now, if you've been paying close attention, you might have noticed that all of the good examples I've given, from Donaher to Bravo to Nurmagomedov, have all been limited to the same category, offensive grappling systems. Now, why does it seem like offensive grappling systems are the only kind of systems that exist? Well, simply put, they're easier to invent. Both defensive grappling and striking encounters inherently have more variables, where it's harder to force dilemmas onto your opponent or predict what they're going to do. In a striking exchange, limiting my opponent to two or three possible moves isn't impossible, but it's very tricky. While some systemization has been attempted in defensive grappling and striking contexts, its reach and success have been limited. As an example, here's a flowchart in which the author attempts to formalize the boxing of Archie Moore. And while this might seem like world-class boxing has been successfully systemized, note that this flowchart doesn't move towards a defined goal. It's just zigzagging around, which makes it way more confusing to look at. Plus, this isn't Archie Moore's entire game. 
This flowchart only covers Moore's most common moves when his opponent throws a jab against his very unique guard. Of course, on the other hand, this is a flowchart based on a fighter that wasn't intentionally using a system. With some further development and some formalization of the involved dilemmas, it's pretty clear that some level of true systemization should be possible. And that's a big deal. New students in striking classes often find sparring to be stressful and overwhelming. Being able to give them clear, concrete answers to problems could make the initial learning curve much easier. And at the higher levels, we would no longer be relying on the fighter's individual instincts and foresight, and would instead be able to implement a rigorously tested chain of moves optimized for a particular sport-wide meta. Much of the grappling world is currently in a period of widespread systemization, but so far, people have largely picked the low-hanging fruit. Whoever is able to implement high-level defensive grappling systems could very well replicate the success and dominance of John Donher, and anyone that develops a truly effective striking system would likely take multiple arts by storm, as everyone else will be way behind the curve and struggling to catch up. While these problems are tough nuts to crack, there are people working on it. Priet Mickelson, whose name I might have just butchered, is a BJJ coach famous for the development of the grilled chicken guard and, more recently, defensive BJJ. Both of these developments are attempts at creating entirely defensive grappling systems that still manage to win competitions. Mickelson has managed to find a reasonable amount of success while tackling a seemingly impossible problem. Defensive BJJ especially has experienced a surge in popularity, but still sees little to no usage at the highest levels of competition. However, further success could push BJJ into a new era, as well as begin the expansion of successful systems beyond the limitations of offensive grappling techniques. Upending grappling, striking, and even MMA is still anyone's game. And if you want to learn how systems are developed and tested, stay tuned for one of my upcoming videos. It'll come out when I get around to it. I'm busy, okay?